Intel just lost over $100 billion in market value. Not because of a product failure. Not because of a data breach. Not even because of a recession. It happened because of a single, quiet decision made thousands of miles away, in Beijing, and executed with surgical precision. Overnight, the world's top chipmaker became the most vulnerable player in a global technology power shift. On April 12, 2025, China's Ministry of Industry and Information Technology issued a policy directive. It wasn't loud. There were no public announcements or headlines splashed across state media. But the impact was immediate and devastating. The directive barred all government agencies and state-backed enterprises from procuring semiconductors made by American companies, specifically Intel, AMD, and Micron. The stated reason? Digital sovereignty and national supply chain security. The real reason? Strategy. Within hours, procurement systems were reprogrammed across dozens of Chinese institutions. Contracts with China Mobile, State Grid, and other major infrastructure partners were canceled or suspended. By the next morning, deals that had been in place for years were wiped off the books. And the most exposed company in the blast radius was Intel. Nearly 27% of Intel's revenue in 2024, roughly $22 billion, came from China. When access to that market was cut off, Intel's stock fell off a cliff, crashing 18.3% in just 48 hours. It was the steepest drop in over a decade. But the market reaction wasn't just about lost sales. It was about what this meant long-term. Investors weren't pricing in a bad quarter. They were pricing in the possibility that China might be finished with U.S. chips entirely. And maybe this wasn't just about semiconductors. Maybe the real target was something deeper, American innovation itself. At first glance, China's move appeared defensive, protecting its infrastructure from foreign dependence. But if you look closer, the structure of the policy looks far more offensive. According to geopolitical analyst Emily Jin at the Center for a New American Security, this wasn't decoupling. This was erosion, deliberate, layered, and specifically designed to weaken U.S. tech dominance over time, not overnight. Intel made itself vulnerable by staying attached. While other companies like NVIDIA built global diversification strategies and formed international AI partnerships, Intel remained deeply tethered to Chinese infrastructure. Its core revenue still depended on PC and server processors, areas where China had entrenched influence. That thread was easy to pull. And when it was, the result was chaos. The collapse in Intel's valuation also dragged down semiconductor ETFs like SOX and SMH. The PHLX Semiconductor Index dropped 4.2% that day. But Intel took the deepest hit because it was the least prepared. Because it was still operating on an outdated assumption that the globalized chip ecosystem of yesterday would remain in Intel's vulnerability didn't appear overnight. It built up over a decade of missteps and missed signals. Back in 2011, Intel controlled nearly 80% of the PC processor market. By the fourth quarter of 2024, that number had dropped to 57%. A string of delayed product rollouts, particularly in its 10 nanometer and 7 nanometer processes, opened the door for AMD to regain lost ground. At the same time, Apple and Amazon began designing their own chips, reducing reliance on Intel's architecture altogether. And then came the financial turbulence. In 2023, Intel posted a staggering $2.8 billion and $8 billion in quarterly net losses. In 2024, the company laid off over 2,000 employees. By the time Beijing made its move, Intel had already lost its pricing power, its dominance, and its strategic insulation. What China did wasn't a sudden strike. It was the final act in a long, predictable unraveling. But perhaps the most important piece of the puzzle isn't about what Intel lost. It's about what China has quietly built. According to internal planning documents reviewed by Reuters, the Chinese government is now executing a national transition plan called Clean Silicon. Its objective is simple. Eliminate all U.S. sourced chips from China's public infrastructure, energy systems, and telecom networks by December 2027. And the deadline isn't symbolic. The document specifies that by the first quarter of 2026, 80% of China's central government computing systems must run on domestically designed processors. This isn't just lost access. This is the forced obsolescence of an entire product category inside the world's second largest economy. Morgan Stanley now estimates that U.S. chipmakers could lose as much as $350 billion of cumulative revenue by the end of 2027.
J.P. Morgan adds that the immediate financial pain, while substantial, is secondary to the long-term threat. Because if China pulls this off, it won't just decouple from U.S. chips. It will prove to the world that the global tech stack can survive, even thrive, without American semiconductors. This isn't just a ban. It's a proof of concept for a post-American digital infrastructure. To understand how serious this is, we only need to look back a few months. In September 2024, teardown firm Tech Insights shocked the tech world by revealing that Huawei's Mate 70 Pro smartphone was running on a domestically produced 5 nanometer chip. This Kirin chip, built by China's SMIC, used older DUV lithography machines, the kind the West had assumed were too inefficient to push past 14 millimeters. But with advanced multi-patterning techniques, China pulled it off. And it didn't just work, it sold. Huawei shipped over 45 million Mate 70 phones in just six months. That wasn't a fluke. It was a signal. A signal that China's semiconductor ecosystem, while Huawei and SMIC surged, with SMIC's revenue jumping 47% year over year, Intel continued to slide. Its data center revenue dropped 22% in Q1 2025. Its Ohio Megafab, once billed as America's answer to Asia's chip dominance, is now delayed until late 2026 due to zoning and construction setbacks. So what does this mean for everyday consumers? The fallout won't stay on Wall Street. It's already working its way through the supply chain. Internal pricing roadmaps reviewed by Bloomberg show OEMs like HP and Dell planning price hikes of up to 17% on new Intel-powered systems. With China gone, Intel can no longer manufacture at scale. That means lower volumes or higher prices, or both. And it doesn't stop with laptops. Cloud computing, enterprise servers, AI training systems in logistics and healthcare, all of it is being repriced. The cost of technology is about to go up. And it's going to show up on invoices across industries. Meanwhile, even as Washington funnels support through the 52.7 billion Chips and Science Act, it's not enough to restore Intel's lost momentum. Intel has secured $8.5 billion in grants and $11 billion in loans. It has a major deal with Amazon Web Services. It's working with the Department of Defense. But capital doesn't equal execution. Factories take years. Reputations take longer. Intel has underperformed the PHLX Semiconductor Index by over 30% in the last year. Goldman Sachs recently downgraded the stock, citing shrinking margins, missed milestones, and increasing foreign competition. Most concerning of all is Intel's slipping technological edge. While Samsung and TSMC are ramping up 3mm and working on Sumen Woodward prototypes, Intel's 18A node isn't expected to reach mass production until mid-2026. And that's if there are no more delays. Former CEO Pat Gelsinger, now in a strategic advisory role, said in March, It's not about winning one quarter, it's about whether we stay in the game for the next decade. But staying in the game requires more than money. It requires credibility. And right now, Intel is short on both. And if you think Intel is the only target, think again. Beijing's next move is already in motion. A potential full-scale export ban on rare earth minerals like gallium and on components critical to AI training chips. This is no longer about isolating a single company. It's about redefining who gets to build the future and who gets left behind. The U.S. still holds the patents. It still leads in design. But Beijing is betting that production, scale, and speed will matter more in this decade than invention did in the last. So we're left with a stark question. Can the country that invented the semiconductor survive becoming dependent on someone else's supply chain? Because China just flipped the switch.